Where are you at in your walk with Jesus? When was the last time you really encountered the glory and goodness of Jesus? When was the last time you really were overwhelmed and overcome by a living, personal, first-hand encounter with him? And when was the last time that you considered whether your way of life is helping or hindering your your journey with Jesus? When was the last time you actually took time to consider, are my daily habits helping me follow Jesus or hindering me following Jesus? These are the kind of questions we want to unpack because I really believe that in all the opportunities God is opening up for us as a church and in all the pressures that we feel in our world, we need to be a people who are regularly encountering God and who are daily walking with God. Regular encounters with God, daily walking with God. That is what will sustain us in a world that is seeking to squeeze the faith out of us, and that is what will equip us to take the opportunity that God has for us in Grangetown, in Canton, and further afield. Moments of encounter, habits of formation. And the power of today is not going to be In my teaching, it is going to be in your responsiveness. I want to make that really clear. I've pulled together a few thoughts. And then at the end of this session and at the end of this afternoon session, uh, we're going to have some interviews with some people in the room about their own experiences with encountering God and with developing habits of discipleship. But then we're going to make space just to do those two things. To encounter God and to open our hearts and our minds to consider how can I build better habits into my life. And so the power of today is in our responsiveness to what God wants to do in us. And we have prayed more than we have prepared, if I could put it like that, (laughs) for this day. Um, I said to Charlotte this morning, like... And this is part of the beauty of having Elka and Nate and other wonderful volunteers who do lots of organising. Like, I'm swanning into today feeling like I've done next to nothing. Um, and I could seem like a really irresponsible pastor in doing so. But let me tell you, friends, I pray for you that we would encounter God and that we would find our way to habits of formation that help us follow Jesus. So how are we going to do all this? Well, we're going to look at a story in Mark's Gospel. Mark chapter 9. Uh, So if you've got Bibles, turn there with me. Mark chapter 9 is going to be our guide in moments of encounter and habits of formation. It's two stories that go together. One is Jesus on a mountain and one is Jesus in a valley. Encounters with God on a mountain, the daily churn of life in the valley. This story is known, the first half as the transfiguration. And the Gospels, I want to remind you, are written primarily as accounts of who Jesus is. They're primarily given to us to unveil to us the person of Christ as the Son of Man, as the Son of God, as the Saviour and Lord. But in the example of the disciples in the Gospels, These books become for us not only accounts about who is Jesus, but accounts about what it means to follow Jesus. And so in these stories, we're going to glimpse afresh who Jesus is, but we are going to learn some lessons for our own personal following of him as we seek to encounter and grow in habits of formation. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to walk through Mark chapter 9, verse 2 to 13 in this morning session. And I'm just going to make comments as I read, Um, rather than reading it all and then bringing some thoughts. Let me just unpack this passage step by step before we interview some people about their own experience of moments of encountering God. When was the last time you really encountered him and felt him close? Mark chapter 9 verse 2 says this, after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John with him and led them up a high mountain where they were all alone. There 
he was transfigured before, before them. Jesus led them up a high mountain where they were all alone, and there he was transfigured before them. When it comes to moments of encountering God, the biblical pattern is that God often encounters people on a mountaintop. Why does he do that? Why has God chosen mountains as a place of encounter? I think there's two fundamental reasons. Number one, because of the elevation of mountaintops. There is something about the ascent and the climb to a high place that reminds us that when we're speaking of an encounter with God, we are speaking of the maker and the creator, the glorious king of the universe, the one who is so far above and beyond us that we can't begin to wrap our minds around him. And there is something in the physical elevation and ascension to a mountaintop that reminds us we are coming to a God that is beyond us. But that there is also the reality about the mountain. Secondly, why would God choose mountains as a place of encounter? Because they are quiet, set apart from life in the busyness and distractions of our world. This is why God repeatedly chose to meet with people on mountains, called Moses up to the mountain to meet with him, to give him the Ten Commandments and revealed his glory to him, called Elijah up to the mountain to meet with him and to restore him to uh, the new ministry that he had for him after Elijah's battles. And here, Jesus takes his disciples And he draws them up to the quiet mountain place. And I want to ask this morning, as we think about encountering God, moments of encounter. When was the last time you climbed a mountain to be with God? And I don't mean that necessarily in terms of actually climbing a mountain, though that is a good thing to do. If you're able to do so, get into that physical environment. But when was the last time that you intentionally set aside time in your daily busyness to ascend into his presence and to leave behind the distractions that could be found in the valley, away from the noise, away from the people, away from the distraction. Jesus led these three disciples up to a high mountain by themselves. Verse three, then it says, He was transfigured before them and his clothes became dazzling white, whiter than anyone in the world could bleach them. Don't you love the way Mark is trying to wrap language around this otherworldly experience of Jesus in his glory here? And what's fascinating to me is not only that that Jesus becomes radiant, which was like a sign of God's glory, that when God appeared and encountered people in Old Testament history, often came with dazzling light. What what is fascinating to me here is that comment um, that he was whiter than anyone in the world uh, could could bleach them, and, and that Jesus in this moment was... Think think about it like this. Jesus had been one thing to Peter, James and John as they were walking up the mountain. And he became something else as they were with him on the mountain. And how much do we need that in our following of Jesus? Maybe you followed Jesus for a long time. And you're used to walking with him as the rabbi on the road. And there's something precious and beautiful about just that, that familiarity who Jesus is to us, of how he's revealed himself to us in the past, of what we believe to be true about him. But the reasons why moments of encounter with God are so important is that we can become over-familiar with Jesus, can't we? And we can lose the sense of wonder of who it is that we are walking with and who it is that we are following and who it is that is our Lord and Saviour. And what an encounter with God does and invites us into is Jesus being one thing, but then becoming something else. And it's not that Jesus is changing, but it is that Jesus is revealing more of his true nature to us. In our world, how much we need that as we go forth into Canton and into Grangetown with the gospel. How much we need people who are convinced that Jesus is not some tag on to life as we know it, but is the all-glorious, beautiful, dazzling saviour 
who is beyond us, whiter than anyone could bleach. Verse 4, it goes on then to say, And there appeared before them Elijah and Moses who were talking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say. They were so frightened. Peter is found doing what Peter always loved to do. He loved to get in his opinion and his take on the situation. And he is overwhelmed. Just just imagine what it was like for this Jew. You're there on the mountaintop. You've come for a picnic with Jesus on the mountainside. First of all, Jesus becomes dazzling white in God's glory. And then Moses and Elijah, who you've heard stories about all your life as you've grown up in synagogue Sunday school, Saturday school, uh, hearing stories about these, these great men of faith, and they appear. Can you imagine what that was like? And so Peter blurts out, hey, let us, let us get some tents together. Tents being assigned, tabernacles, place of God's presence. And Peter wants to build a place to honour the presence of Moses and Elijah there with Jesus. Now, obviously, we'll see in a second what Peter fundamentally gets wrong is putting Jesus on par with these other figures. But notice as well that what we can often do when it comes to encountering God and being in a space of encounter is we can seek to plan and to organise and to over-organise God's living presence among us. I was sat there this morning, being completely honest with you, thinking, oh man, we've got no words for the songs. How do we do this? I'm going to organisational mode. And I I didn't even think twice about going to the back desk because Joel is the best person in the world that I would want in that situation to be fixing that thing. And he did an amazing job to bring the words back. But how often in church life are we caught thinking about the practicalities? We've had to do that a bit in this season, haven't we? We're planting a new congregation, so... What is the word that comes to the forefront? Rotors, 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 rotors. There's something brilliant and good about rotors. They are a sign and a symbol of our desire to serve one another and to make room for others to encounter God. We are passionate in that way about rotors, about being well organized so that people experience the warmth of family. Rotors are the scaffolding. We want them to experience more than a rotor. Certainly, but they help foster culture of love and of care and of welcome. But I want to speak to us as Grace Church five years in. I know some of us are much newer to Grace Church. But have we lost some of that core of why we exist? We exist first and foremost to be a a community of encounter with God. Have we become so focused at times on the scaffolding of church? Let's set up some tents. Let's make this thing kind of work and function and organised. It's a great need for that. But let's not be found to be like Peter and missing what is happening before our eyes. For some of you this morning, we want to create today as a space where you can forget about the rotors, where you can forget about the pressures of work, where you can forget about the pressures of family, and you can return to the simple and central reason that you exist to be a child of the living God and to meet with him and to hear him say your name and share his heart with you verse 7 a cloud appeared over and covered them and a voice came from the cloud this is my son whom I love listen to him suddenly they looked around they no longer saw anyone with them except Jesus. You see, the fundamental thing that Peter got wrong here is he was putting Moses and Elijah on a par with Jesus. And so this cloud and this voice appear once again in biblical history. The cloud and the voice are are, are part of the pattern of how God speaks and meets with and encounters in his people. Only instead of coming and of handing to Moses the Ten Commandments or handing to Elijah a new commission as happened on Moses and Elijah's mountaintop experiences, What do the cloud and voice point Peter and James and John to? Jesus. And friends, when we speak about encountering God, 
Even this morning as we pray for each other, as we enter into a time of worship, where we can easily get drawn into is focus upon experience and feelings. And I want to say that there is something very good and appropriate and right about that. And we are unashamedly, in the next half an hour or so, going to seek an experience with God. God is not just some abstract truth that you are sent to. He is a living person that you experience. He's a living person that you experience. And we want to chase after encounters with God that take over and overwhelm our senses so that we are left forever changed. But don't miss that such an experience of God doesn't terminate on the feelings and the experience, but it terminates in Jesus. We are given an encounter with God so that we can be left with this sense of Jesus. It's Jesus. The voice speaks. This is my son. This is the reason why clothes are dazzling white and why you're up here on a mountain with cloud and all this sensation. It is in order that you might see the Lord Jesus more clearly. And in our world, once again, and in our church, as we grow and as we branch out, we will be distracted by many things. And encounters with God is what brings us back to that that central reason why we exist. We exist for Jesus and Jesus alone, for his glory, for his name, to know him better and to make him known. And that is why we need an encounter with God, because when we truly encounter God, we are left with a greater sense of who Jesus Christ is. And that is what gives us courage to live. That is what gives us the faith to persevere in the valley. As the story then ends, they were coming down the mountain and Jesus gave them orders not to tell anyone what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. They kept the matter to themselves, discussing what rising from the dead means. And they asked him, why do the teachers of the law say that Elijah must come first? Jesus replied, to be sure, Elijah does come first and restores all things. Why then is it written that the Son of Man must suffer much and be rejected? But I tell you, Elijah has come and they have done to him everything that they wished, just as it was written about him. The final thing I want to say about encountering God is that encounters with God are so precious because they leave us with this secret life of intimacy with him. There is nothing more precious in life than just a secret walk with your maker, your master, your creator, that what God intended for us since the Garden of Eden, that we would walk with him in the cool of the day, that on our deathbeds we might have this storehouse of times of knowing his presence close, of times of intimacy with our maker. And that's what Peter, James and John were left with, this secret experience of intimacy with God. And God wants to give each of you in this room, I really believe this, a secret life with him that maybe no one else knows about and that is tailor-made to your wounds, what you have experienced. God wants to speak tailor-made words of comfort and healing into your history. He wants to speak tailor-made words of purpose and of destiny into your future. He wants to speak tailor-made words of fortification and courage into your presence. There is nothing more precious than knowing that intimacy with God. But don't miss as well that encounters with God don't just leave us with a secret life with God. They also leave us with questions. It's interesting, isn't it? Peter comes down the mountain and he's still chatting. He's got, he's got more questions. What was all that about? And why do they say Elijah must come first? And we're not going to go into all of the ins and outs of that and the link to John the Baptist and all of those things. But I know many of us in this room, as we, as we navigate planting congregations as a church, and as we navigate confusing trends in our world, we've got questions. We're confused. That's what it means to be human. How much better to have questions from an encounter with God than apart from encounters with God? 
how much better to have a living relationship with him and then to ask, what is Leviticus all about? (laughs) In relationship with the author, the one who is behind Leviticus. Or what is this current trend in society about? What, What is God doing in the world today? Why is there so much suffering and evil? The invitation of our lives as followers of Jesus is not to tick a box of what we believe and then to go off and question those things, but in friendship with God. To walk through this meandering world and to bring our confusions and our questions into a living relationship with Jesus where there's regular moments of encounter with God. How did this experience change Peter, James and John? Well, in 2 Peter 1 Verse 16 and 18, Peter gives us the answer to that question when he writes this. For we did not follow cleverly devised stories when we told you about the coming of our Lord Jesus in power, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. He received honour and glory from God the Father when the voice came to him from the majestic glory saying, This is my son who I am loved, who I love, with him I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this voice that came from heaven when we were with him on the sacred mountain. You may have not known that Peter reflected on this experience when he wrote his letter. But what's he getting at there? What did this encounter? Why was a moment of encounter like this so important for for Peter? Why is it so important for us? Because God's heart and passion is to have followers of his son who have a first-hand relationship with him. That's what Peter was getting at there. We didn't receive these stories as like something that was just passed down through factual information, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. We were with him there on the mountain. And so he wants us to be. Friends, I think what Canton needs and what Grangetown needs, what your workplace needs, what your children need, what your family and friends and neighbours need is not you to be the perfect, all singing, all dancing, perfectly moral Christian that none of us can ever attain to be. We're still Peter fumbling off the mountain with questions and struggles. What our communities and what our families and what our neighbours need is for us to be walking in a living first-hand experience with God. Coming down the mountain, radiating something of his glory, walking into our days, met with him this morning walking out of Sunday mornings I've met with God and he's spoken to me, he's challenged me, he's convicted me and that is what we're inviting us as a church into in this season is to be a people moments we encounter with God